Good morning and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion. I'm Ladi Akiri Dunwale. The headlines. A fourth round of talks between Russia and Ukraine is to start this morning. Russia allegedly asks China for military help and aid in evading sanctions. Plus, 21 children are flown to the United Kingdom for cancer treatment from Ukraine. Let's begin uh, with updates from this morning. It's day 19 of the Russian invasion with no end really in sight. A new round of talks between Russia and Ukraine will be held this morning via video link and is expected to start at 10.30 a.m. Kiev time. At least one person has been killed and three others injured after a residential building was hit by shelling in the capital of Kiev. Meanwhile, Ukraine's state emergency service says two bodies were found and three people were taken to the hospital in the strike uh, earlier on this morning. Also, Ukraine's armed forces said it struck down four planes belonging to Russia's forces in the last 24 hours, adding that it launched crushing strikes on Russian field bases. In the meantime, there are reports that Russia is asking China for military equipment to use in its invasion of Ukraine, a request that has heightened tensions about the ongoing war. This comes ahead of the meeting in Rome between top aides for the U.S. and Chinese governments. In advance of those talks, White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warned China to avoid helping Russia evade punishment from global sanctions that might harm the economy. Mr. Sullivan adds that the United States says China will face harsh consequences if it aids Russia in its invasion of Ukraine. And back in uh, Ukraine, residents of Kherson have uh, been demonstrating against Russia's invasion of the country. Uh, that was, of course, yesterday, while sounds of heavy gunfire rattled through the streets. Wearing Ukrainian flags and chanting, go home, the residents confronted a Russian military convoy displaying the symbol Z. In a video obtained by Reuters, gunfire erupted as the protesters marched through the streets, while several military vehicles passed in the opposite direction. On Saturday, the deputy head of Kherson's local council had said Russia is planning a pseudo-independence referendum in the town. Russian forces captured Kherson following the start of the invasion on February the 24th. All right, in Kherson itself, there is a Nigerian, Jerry Kenny, who joins us now uh, virtually for more. Uh, good morning, Jerry. Thank you for your time and for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to reach out to the people of Nigeria. Thank you very much. My first question to you is, what are you still doing in Kherson? Um... That question is uh, not a question of choice, that we choose to stay here in Kherson. Uh, we've tried all our possible means individually to evacuate Kherson, but to no avail. So um, during the, in the process, uh, our life uh, was at risk, which uh, it was something that was seen by everybody, and we have to take cover, go back because of the crossfire, and also to avoid stray bullet. So, Everybody knows what happened in Kesson, as you just display. That's that's life. Um, is not uh, is not a is not is not a movie. And for us to stay safe for now, while we wait for the government to do the necessary thing for the green corridor, we need to take cover. That's why we are still here, waiting for the government intervention. Now uh, you are president of the International Students Union uh, uh, in Kesson, and that means that you are in charge of your colleagues uh, from various parts uh, of uh, the world, shall we say, but in particular, uh, our fixation, of course, is with Nigerians. How are you guys coping, given the situation there? Because Kherson is now under Russian control, and uh, 
that makes it slightly different from other cities. The last time I spoke to you on this program, uh, it wasn't under Russian control fully then. It was under attack, but it wasn't under control of Russian forces. What's different now? Okay, now um, we are not allowed to, to gain um, exits. Uh, that's the Green Corridor because it has been captured by uh, the Russians. So they are preventing the Ukrainian army's um, invasions. So that's why the, there's no green corridor. And moreover, uh, the bombing, the sounds, and the explosion is really, really terrible. And now, um, in terms of um, no provisions, uh, medical aid are limited because they attend to the casualties in the hospitals first because they are taken at the priority. So. For you that are getting sick with, with cold, some little things that can transfer to something else, then uh, you have no options than to stay indoor and look for possible means to help yourself in terms of treatment. It has been a very terrible situation, and um, I've been doing this all alone until two days back where uh, some NGOs contacted me because I stopped receiving calls from people because everybody just call you they ask for how are you doing, how when you know the situation is critical and nobody's doing anything. So for now, I will say um, there's some improvement in terms of um, the people that are coming in board to see how they can evacuate us here from Fresh Kesson. Because I was, most of the uh, Nigerian students, like six of them are sick and as, as we speak, and uh, I take care of uh, their welfare to ensure they are fine not with the help of anybody, but with, with, with the help of um, God and my little strength that I have to render. So as that um, this week, we have some development minister of foreign affairs, that's um, Godfrey Onyema called me, and he gave us hope that uh, very soon we, we evacuate us from Kesson. He said he uh, also he spoke to some bodies, uh, also have Ambassador Abdullah. Well, I'm mentioning your names in there. You know, most people call us and nothing is being done. So I'm um, calling uh, this name. So if we are still here, I think uh, they should be held responsible because they give us hope. So I want to I want to know if it's a false hope or they are uh, doing something possible for us to go out of here. A lot of them, Ambassador uh, Abdullah Isheu in Moscow also reached out to me. Ambassador Akiremi Bonaji from Abuja also reached out to me. Ambassadors in Poland and Representative Mr. Kingsley from Romania and we have um, other international bodies coming in because the situation now is very, very critical. Uh, Ambassador Chibuzo Onyebuno, that's the Nido, um, the Europe, um, Europe Ambassador representative for the former Assistant Secretary Nido UK. He spoke to me, and Ambassador Rex Usi Nowo also called me, that's the Nido as well. Um, he's the chairman and board of members for former and former chairman of Nido Russia. So Bim Oluwa Suna also called me, that's Nero European uh, Europe Ambassador, Representative and Assistant Secretary to Nero UK. So I'm, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to cut in, Jerry, but uh, all these diplomats that you're talking about, they all promised to step in. I mean, starting with the foreign affairs minister all the way down, uh, they've all they've all promised to step in to the matter. But uh, from what we have heard about situations like this. There's very little, it seems, that they can do except you and your colleagues can get to the border. Now, because Russia is in control of Kherson, and from what you've just explained, that is next to impossible currently. In fact, yesterday, the report is that there was a shelling very near to where you were staying, to your residence. Uh, so it's becoming tough here now, isn't it? Yes, very correct. Very correct. So I, I sent I sent I sent a video to um, the UK. I sent a video to some bodies, and I I tell them if they can get this out um, to people that can uh, see this. I also recorded my voice for them to know how critical it is. You know, when we come online, they think we're, we are joking. They think we are just trying to make out something. Oh, they are safe because they are still having skin in them. But what I'm telling the Nigerians is this: we can talk now. We can speak out now. That's why we are speaking. When these people are down, nobody will speak. So uh, I'm, I'm doing this not because I'm, I'm NGO. I'm also a student as well. So I took the responsibility to ensure that everybody's out of person. So I've been talking to a lot of bodies, and uh, I wish I get help. But sometimes when you see people call you, they give you hope, and um, nothing is happening. 
So it's really, really terrible for for you to know how how it is. Uh, like um, when these guys were sick, I have to risk and go out to get them pills because after the doctor checked them, they found out that okay, they are really, really suffering from cold. So I took that responsibility. I went out, risking my life. That's to let the Nigerians know how terrible it is. This um, place we are, they are ready to help, but there's less um, little supply of uh, medications and they can check you and they tell you, okay, this is what to get. How will you get those things when they don't have supply? So demand is much and supply is little. So I wish I can, I don't know what to say again. And uh, I what, think what, will I, you be, I, what will you be asking for right now? Because the, the, what, I, what I had said previously is that most of the Nigerian diplomats who have spoken have said that except the Nigerians or the Nigerian students in your case get to either the Polish, Hungarian or Romanian borders, there's very little they can do. From the description you've given now, it's next to impossible to leave Kherson safely yes. now. So what is it that those, the Nigerian officials who are listening to you now, uh, including all those that you have listed, starting with the Foreign Affairs Minister, what exactly is it that they can do to get you out of Kherson? Okay, um, I've been able to speak with the um, some um, mayor of Kherson and some, uh, I approached, uh, I think last week I approached the commandant in charge of Kherson. So I, I spoke to him, actually. So what he told me is this. He said, they, this issue is from the top. You know what, what it means? He said, we need to communicate. They are told that uh, when we are approaching, they will know there is a former ceasefire. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. the government need to liaise with the Russian people and also the Ukrainian people. They will come in agreement for a ceasefire. So once this is done, we know we are safe. The next thing for us to do is to try and evacuate during that period of time. So because I've been able to get uh, the numbers of people, you know, uh, I have not only Nigerians in my stuff, that's outside, but I came in to speak for the Nigerians in my custody. You understand? So I'm working with international bodies as well. So when once they can come in, anybody that can come in, I will try all my possible best to ensure that all students are safe. But now there is little to be done. So all these people need to come in 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 in, in contact with the Russian and the Ukrainian for them to cease fire. Without that, I'm not sure there is anything we can do for now to escape. All right, then, uh, Jerry Kenny. Um, of course, uh, I'm sure that many of the officials you've listed are listening once again, and uh, in all probability, they're already uh, taking action in this regard. But war situations, as you probably now know, are very difficult uh, to meander through. But we wish you the very best, as always. Please stay safe. You will get out of there uh, eventually. That's, uh, that's my conviction. So please stay safe until that happens. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you for giving me a listening ear. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, this morning, about 31 people have also returned to Nigeria from uh, Ukraine. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, was at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja, where they touched down. We are at the international wing of the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, where 31 evacuees from Ukraine have arrived in Nigeria aboard a Turkish airline. Uh, we were told uh, that the airline arrived at about 6.30 a.m. this morning. Uh, contrary to our expectation that it was going to be at the regular point where uh, the evacuees that have arrived so far, you know, uh, landed. These ones are coming, uh, like I said, uh, they are arriving at the international wing of the airport, uh, which makes it a bit difficult for us uh, that we're not able to get the arrival, uh, the disembarkment from the uh, flight and, and, you know, the regular uh, activities that take place on the arrival. Uh, such as the COVID-19 uh, testing, the documentation, and other procedures that they have had, the previous sets have had to uh, follow. 
Uh, but we have been told by officials of the Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry, uh, who were here with us earlier on, uh, that 31 uh, evacuees are arriving uh, this morning. So you are victors, and we want you to see yourself in that manner. We don't want you to be depressive, neither do we want you to be agitated. Some of you will be concerned about your education. How do we continue? I would like to assure you that the federal government is in negotiation with neighboring countries to ensure that you can further your education. Also, your schools are reaching out to us for the possibility of online study. But whatever happens, you will not lose any year. Therefore, concerning your education, be rest assured. What we will need from you now is proper documentation. We have your name here, but please ensure that the telephone number and the emails are correct, because that's the way we can reach you. Government has made provision for a support that can take you home, so you'll be giving a hundred dollar each. Please, if you are not a student or a returnee from Ukraine, don't collect the hundred dollar. It is meant for that purpose. After that, you will be free to go to your respective homes. Already you have done your COVID test, and I pray that it turns, you know, right, negative. Whatever happens, if it turns positive, we will communicate with you so that you can go for treatment in any of government hospitals. You know, COVID is a deadly uh, disease or virus. So we are happy to have you. Uh, you probably have questions. There are hotlines that you can reach us. And I'm sure that you know that this arrangement is put together on behalf of federal government by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, under which there are three agencies that are participating. NEMA, which is National Emergency Management Agency, NAPTIC, which is against human trafficking, and finally, the Refugee Commission. Yesterday, another group of Nigerian students, those who were seen in a viral video last week, asking the federal government to get them out of Ukraine, are back in Nigeria. The students, numbering about 300, were fleeing from the crisis and have been successfully evacuated by the federal government. They arrived home on board an Air Osman flight from Budapest, Hungary. Another batch of Nigerian evacuees from Ukraine arrive at the Nnamdi Azikiwe International Airport Abuja on Saturday. The Osman flight arrived at about 8.40 p.m. These batch of returnees are mostly stranded students in Sumi who had asked the federal government to rescue them amidst attack by Russian invaders. Inside the hall, they are documented. They also undergo COVID-19 testing. Some of them share their experiences while in Ukraine. A couple of weeks ago, they came to give us an information that they want to cut off the light from Russia. So we said, OK, no problem, that we are fully prepared. But very early on Thursday, around 5 AM, we had the missile being shot at our military bag, which is almost direct opposite our school. So we are asked to move to the bunker. From there, we start living our life under the bunker. So we only have maybe like 30 minutes of ourselves. We cannot cook. We cannot eat. We sleep in the bunker, everything under the bunker. I feel very happy and safe because honestly, the situation back in Sumi especially wasn't funny at all. We were so scared because we were stuck and then coming back now, we feel very happy. They are received by a delegation from the government led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Each of the evacuees is handed 100 United States dollars and a SIM card to facilitate their communication. We have capacity to go for more than uh, what we have done now. In fact, we have not gone halfway from our projection. So, but one thing you must also know is that there are a lot that are coming through commercial flights. And uh, we are paying. And sometimes when you have 
five, ten, twenty. You can't send a whole jumbo jet to go and carry those people. So for such number, we organize one-way ticket for each of them, and they are arriving in their numbers. As they complete the necessary processes, they are released to their family members who did not hide their joy as they received them. We'll take a break on Russian invasion. When we come back, we'll be talking to someone else who was lucky enough to get away from the crisis in Ukraine. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Russia speaking yesterday insisted that it had attacked the Yavorev training facility in western Ukraine, adding that the strike had killed up to 180 foreign mercenaries and destroyed a large amount of weapons supplied by outside nations. Defense Ministry spokesperson Igor Konoshenkov told a briefing that Russia would continue its attacks against what he called foreign mercenaries. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman is of the opinion that Russia is showing signs that it might be willing to have substantive negotiations over Ukraine, even as Moscow is currently intent on, quote, destroying its neighbor. Sherman, in an interview with Fox News Sunday, says the United States is putting enormous pressure on Russian President Vladimir Putin to agree to a ceasefire in its weak-old invasion of Ukraine and to allow the creation of humanitarian corridors so that civilians can escape. Linus Baca is one of those who has uh, recently returned from uh, Ukraine. He was trapped in Sumy up until last week, but was able to get away after humanitarian corridors were opened. Hello, Linus. Hello, good morning, sir. Where are you speaking from? From Abuja, sir. You are in Abuja, so congratulations and welcome back home. I'm sure Abuja is a Thank sea change so from Sumy. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> yes, sir. But you're keeping up with developments back there. Do you know if there are any Nigerians who are still, shall we say, in some kind of uh, tickle in uh, Sumi or other areas, apart from Kherson, where we know that there is uh, uh, trouble at the moment? But do you know of other Nigerians? Are they, have they been in touch with you that, look, the situation is still difficult for us here? Um, I don't think there is any other Nigerian or African in, in Sumi. I, I don't know of any. I don't know of any. I think um, uh, the evacuation buses took everybody, everybody, everybody out of Sumi. But other parts of Ukraine, uh, I assume, of course, you have friends and colleagues in other parts of Ukraine, uh, and this movement is slowly developing uh, more and more. People are being evacuated. But what are you hearing? Are the evacuations quite effective? More and more people. You talked about the buses taking away everyone from Sumi. Is that now being replicated from what you're hearing in the other parts of the Ukraine? Yes, um, I, have, I have friends all over Ukraine, and um, those of them that have cried out, even um, the Kherson students too, uh, to be very honest, the evacuation have been very, very uh, smooth and very, very effective. Given uh, what the situation is now, you are back in Abuja, uh, but I want to find out from you, do you have any plans? Uh, what are you hearing about the possibility that when all of this settles down, you'll be able to go back and do what you were doing before uh, it all burst into crisis? Um, yes. I um, Just two days ago, I heard, I heard the president, um, Zelensky, was saying that um, they are focusing on rebuilding Ukraine already. Uh, he's seen past the war. Um, absolutely. When everything uh, settles, when the war is over, I think myself and Many people I've spoken with would definitely return to finish our education in Ukraine, sir. I, the report, one of the reports we played before we came to discuss with you now, has the Nigerian authorities saying things like, uh, 
that there are ne negotiations ongoing with neighboring countries uh, in, uh, in Ukraine and probably even closer to home to see how some of you whose education has been interrupted can continue such education in those places. Are those the kind of things that you and some of your colleagues uh, would consider uh, instead of going back to a war-torn country, shall we say? Um, yes. Um, when we're at uh, uh, Hungary, the, the ambassador told us that there are negotiations going on with other schools there to, to absorb as, as much as um, uh, the people that are willing to. Well, um, it is not a bad option at all, but uh, I mean, there, there are final year students in Ukraine that um, they, they are just left with three months to finish. So I think those ones, they would, they would love to uh, transfer to um, an immediate school so that they can, they can complete their school. But I think majority of people that I have spoken with uh, really want to go back uh, to Ukraine if everything is, is, is settled. At the moment, you are in Abuja. What are you doing in Abuja while waiting for all of this? Uh, with, with, with family trying to um, recount all the events of things that have, that have unfolded. But, but me personally, uh, my supervisor has, has, has contacted me and would, would continue working online, uh, hopefully before everything, everything finishes. All right, then, uh, Linus, we'll come back to you uh, over the next uh, couple of days to see how you're keeping up and to know what the arrangements are. Of course, you do know, I'm sure, that uh, there are negotiations restarting again this morning between uh, Russia and Ukraine to see how, can, uh, how this uh, crisis can be resolved. We can only keep our fingers crossed and wish them the best. But for now, thank you for yeah. joining us this morning. Thank you so much. So many protests have continued to spring up all over the world against Russia's action in Ukraine. Up to 30,000 anti-war protesters demonstrated in support of Ukraine in Berlin. According to the police, the protesters are demanding that President Vladimir Putin end the invasion and saying it was important to show solidarity. Many say they are willing to make the demonstrations a regular Sunday activity. Osarumen is Zevoko, and I hope that is correct, is another Nigerian who was able to flee Ukraine and got to Germany with his wife and children. He joins us now uh, virtually. Uh, I understand that uh, for security reasons, exactly where you are in Germany uh, remains undisclosed. But thank you for joining us at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. What was what was the journey like uh, getting out? So I mean, you are you are practical evidence that these humanitarian corridors are working. Well, uh, basically, I'd say that it was an individual initiative. I had to move at the nick of time, and 30 minutes after I moved, I was called um, to inform that uh, my um, home, um, my area, the area where we lived, had been bombed. So, so basically, what I'm trying to say is that there is no concerted effort by any group of people to evacuate um, stranded individuals, stranded Nigerians from the hot spots in Kiev. Although I've been seeing some individuals, you know, a private initiative to just move in and try to take people out. I will not. I will not want to undermine the efforts of those wonderful uh, individuals. But when we talk about institutional arrangement, governmental initiative, there is no such effort to to evacuate people. This is, is just the truth. Is that is that because perhaps there are, the negotiations have been tortuous? and nothing has actually been concluded about the humanitarian corridors. You will notice that the first question I asked you was if you were and your family were evidence that they were working. From your response, it doesn't seem that that is correct, but in that this situation... Exactly. In the situation that we find ourselves now, uh, we are all aware that there are disagreements between Russia and Ukraine, even about those corridors and where those corridors should lead. So is, it, uh, is, is that continuing to be the problem? You talk about individual initiatives. How do those kind of initiatives work when, more or less, this is a government-to-government -government fight? 
Well, I'd like to say, first of all, we should not beat a dead, a dead dog. We should beat a dead horse. Um, we should be more proactive in our actions, see? When we were there, there were open, there were, there were opportunities. There were times when it was um, um, viable. I'll use the word viable now. There were times when it was viable uh, that the government moved in. It was safer at that point. But then I saw in the Nigerian dailies where the government said it was dangerous to move in. We were in the hot spot. We moved out. We saw the terrain. We've, we, saw, we saw the path. I think they really did not do investigations to be able to confirm, you know, the news re uh, report in the Nigerian dailies, you know, on, on TV um, when they said that it was dangerous to evacuate Nigerians. But fundamentally speaking, I believe that proactivity is what we're lacking here. We wait till, till things get out of hand, till things are not are not are no more possible then we then throw in you know our hats to say that we cannot so basically i still know of an individual um who has gone into ukraine to try to get um our people out one or two people he's just trying his best um i can't recollect his name now but i i was able to get his name and also uh, uh gave him some names of individuals that he could please uh, uh get out of the hot spot and then you see when i was coming out i had to hire a car you know i had to hire a car that took i and my family out you see and i hired the car for like 10 days i paid for 10 days so after the the car brought us out i i mandated the car to the driver to go back into Ukraine and try to get as m as many as possible you know out of the hotspot so you see basically to answer your question I think that proactivity is what we're lacking here I see that we don't even have a concerted strategic effort to 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 actually walk to actually save the lives of Nigerians and this is why the lives of Nigerians and Africans down here are not valued because our government do not understand the value of our lives. Now you are in Germany. What, what are your plans uh, now that you and your family, thank God, are safe in Germany? What are your plans? Well, my plans basically are to, are to, are to go on with the tides. Um, now, when I say the tides, it doesn't mean that I am not being, I am not being uh, proactive with my actions. When I, when I say the tides, I, I, mean, I mean the process. The process Absolutely. is on ground. You see, so we have to follow the process. We have to see to the fact that we are we are going through, you know, uh, uh, step by step to actualizing our eventual eventual safe haven. So, uh, but then I would quickly like to come in here quickly. Please allow me to say this. Um, when you talk about evacuation, you don't just jump into evacuation. You don't just say you are evacuating people. You are evacuating people into what? You are evacuating people from what? And how are you evacuating people? You need to understand that, 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 that the strategic aspect of evacuation should be brought into, into, into view. Now, when you talk about taking students from Ukraine and sending them back to Nigeria. We have some of these students whose parents, you know, some of them are roadside uh, tomato sellers. Some of them are just menial job uh, parents, you know, people that hardly going by, going by, by, by the day and then they put all their resources together. Some of them sell their properties and lands to send their children abroad to school. And then something happens abroad and the government says, we are evacuating you back to your parents. That is going to be like, like, like uh, it's going to be a bit, a bit, a bit too harsh. You're not helping them. What you should do is to strategically confer with with the with the government, the host government. You know, the first the first part of call because some of them were evacuated. Uh, some of them moved by themselves into Hungary, some of them moved to Poland, some of them moved to uh, Romania. You see, at those locations, the government should be waiting for them there, conferring with the government of those countries on how they can transfer them into universities in those countries. So they don't get to lose on both ends. They've lost financially. They've lost in their academics. And you're sending them back home. To what? Are you going to, are you, are you even making provisions for them to continue their 
education back home in Nigeria, in the Nigerian universities. So these are some of the things that the government should be looking at. Proactivity is what I don't see here. We are just doing evacuation, evacuation, evacuation. Evacuation from what? Evacuation to what? And how are you doing the evacuation? This is my humble submission. Thank you so very much, uh, Osarume Zebogro. Of course, I'm sure the officials involved are listening. And these questions that you're asking speak to your original comment about proactivity and having a long-term strategy about what to do with those who are involved in this crisis, which is not of their making. Uh, thank you so very much. These are questions that we will continue to ask as well uh, right here. Thank you very uh, uh, much, and, and good me. luck. Excuse me, please. Excuse yes. me, please. Hello? Yeah. Uh, is, uh, I'd like to. I'd like to make a very short comment. Can I make a very short comment, please? You have because one minute. Opportunity. One minute. Just okay. one minute. Okay. Okay. Now this is an opportunity that Nigerian is losing now. In the international chess game, we are we are we are we are losing out on proactivity again. See, Europe needs gas. We should get gas to them from Nigeria. Europe need gas, needs gas. We should get gas to them from Nigeria. I don't know how you're go going to do it, but we should get into the international chess game now. Thank you. All right, then. Again, uh, another proactive uh, theme there. Uh, uh, Osarame, thank you so much uh, for that. I'm sure all those who are involved are listening and will probably take it from there, but it's good to know that even though you yourself are struggling through this tough tide, you have uh, you have this in mind. Thank you so very much and wish you the best alongside your family. Thank you. Thank you very God much for joining you. us. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Now, let's move on. Uh, with Sunday's Russian missile attack on Ukraine's military base close to Poland, it's not clear if uh, the NATO instructors who work at the Yavoriv International Center for Peacekeeping and Security were injured. It's a dicey situation because of the proximity of this attack to a NATO member state, and the United States had vowed to protect every inch of a NATO territory. Channels Television's Amarachi Ubani on, foreign affairs, uh, on our Foreign Affairs Program, Diplomatic Channel, spoke to Doug Brooks, the founder of International Stability Operations Association, who has spent a lot of time in the Ukraine. There are fears that Russia could employ the use of chemical weapons, according to Mr. Brooks, and this would be terrible for everyone. Do you think Russia wants NATO to be involved in this war, NATO and the United States? Well, NATO and the United States are involved in the war. Obviously, they're shipping weapons. They've been doing training uh, for the Ukrainian military, uh, excellent training for uh, ever since 2014. Um, so, uh, a direct confrontation with Russia, I think uh, Russia does not want to see that. Um, just to put this in perspective, the, uh, Germany has, has just decided to increase its um, defense spending by 25%, so one quarter. Um, that 25% is equivalent of the entire Russian military budget. And that's just one out of, what, 30 countries in NATO. And a lot of countries are increasing their military budget. So I think uh, Russia definitely does not want to have a direct confrontation with NATO any more than NATO wants to confront Russia. Many have wondered, uh, Doug, if Russia would find some excuse to introduce chemical weapons into this war. What would be the consequences of that? Uh, I think that would be terrible for everybody. Um, certainly the U.S., who's, uh, who has been very open with their intelligence, has been saying that the Russians are toying with this idea of using chemical weapons. Um, uh, I think it would be a disaster for everybody. Um, the uh, U.S. Is, uh, and, and the West has basically said this would be a um, uh, red line for them. This is something that, that should not be done. Um, rather, I, you know, there's a lot of reasons from a tactical perspective that you don't use chemical weapons. Uh, it's hard to understand why the Russians would in this particular case, uh, unless they're simply, or unless Putin, I should say, is simply in it for vengeance. Um, but I, uh, I sincerely hope, and I think everybody uh, sincerely hopes that the Russians do not take that step. No, speaking of Putin, I'm glad you mentioned him. Uh, he's promised, uh, sometime last week, he said that the worst is yet to come in this war. What do you think he meant by that? Uh, well, he's probably right. Um, the, the war has, I think the Russians have been uh, um, very disappointed by the results so far. Uh, they have not been able to take Kiev, the capital in Ukraine. 
Uh, they've not been able to take any uh, of the large cities. And the resistance from the Ukrainians, I think, has astonished the Russians. Also, the Russians have found out that their military is not nearly as professional as they, as they thought. So this has, been, uh, this has been very, very bad for them. And uh, um, their alternatives at this point are to withdraw or to negotiate a withdrawal um, or um, you know, perhaps become more brutal. And uh, there are some sources are saying that they're running out of their uh, guided weapons or guided munitions, uh, meaning that uh, the weapons they'll have less are going to be the more uh, area effect, uh, which is to say these multiple rocket launchers and so on. Uh, essentially, you're not aiming at a, a target, a specific target so much as an area, uh, which could be a very well a city, as we've seen in, in some of the videos coming out of the conflict. So yes, it could become much, much more brutal. Um, we hope that does not go there. Um, the Russian military is um, feeling this one. Uh, uh, it's, it's not going well. And uh, the hope is that, that maybe saner heads uh, will prevail in Russia and they will come up with a better solution than simply brutalizing their neighbor. For more on that interview, do watch Diplomatic Channel today, 14th of March at 8.30 p.m. right here on Channel's television. We'll take another break where we'll come back. Among others, we'll be taking a look at the impact of this invasion as we do daily on business and sports. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. As part of efforts uh, to help refugees flee in Ukraine, more details of a scheme to match Ukrainian refugees with people in the United Kingdom who are considering opening up their homes are to be set out later. A website enabling people to express an interest in helping for which they will receive a thank you of £350 a month will then go live. Leveling up Secretary Michael Gove said the plan could benefit tens of thousands of displaced people. Meanwhile, the British Health Secretary says a group of Ukrainian children have in fact arrived in the United Kingdom to undergo life-saving cancer treatment on the NHS. Sajid Javid says the 21 children will be offered the best possible care in hospitals around the country. The children and their immediate family members arrived on an urgent flight arranged by the government yesterday after a plea from Polish officials. They will be assessed by doctors before being sent to appropriate hospitals. The Russian government is due to pay $117 million on two of its dollar-denominated bonds, but it has been signaling that it will not, or if it does, it will be in rubles, which is tantamount to a default. Russia has already lost access to almost half of its reserves, and the total volume of Russian reserves is about $640 billion, and about $300 billion cannot be accessed following sanctions from Western countries. Well, to discuss this and other such economic fallouts, Ine John Mekwa joins me uh, on Russian Invasion. Hi, Ine. Good morning. So, basically, we talked about this last week and yes. the possibility that this could happen. Yes. And now it does appear as if it's coming. It's very close. In fact, the IMF has said that it seems there's no doubt anymore because they're just supposed to pay it on Wednesday. That's, you know, they just have Tuesday in between. Absolutely. And, uh, it doesn't look like uh, they'll be able to pay it. And the threat, of course, of using rubles to pay is even uh, a bigger one because right now, one dollar is 133 uh, rubles. So, you so know, they'll be looking for, even if they decide to pay rubles, they'll yes. be looking for even more. Exactly, exactly. So it, it's a whole lot going on, uh, on there because the ruble has lost about 40% uh, at this time. And that they can't even access. You know, they have, they even have reserves in gold and all this. You but know, they can't, uh, these are things that can't be accessed. That cannot at the be accessed. So it's not like they don't have the money, but the sanctions have uh, tightened their access to some of, of this uh, wealth that they do have. Uh, some people have called it uh, the. Uh, the gold war, <laughs> gold war. Well, uh, it, one would understand that from, I mean, <laughs> given uh, everything we've been saying. Mm. They, 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 uh, talking about gold, that's one of the commodities. Exactly. Uh, uh, like, you know, <laughs> as price, uh, as, as uh, oil, for instance, is going up, gold is also going up. And a lot of investors, in fact, traders of jewelries and all those gold-related, are saying they don't, that uh, customers do not want to be paid in cash anymore. They want to be paid in gold, you know, because... At, for this time, it is a hedge. 
so it's protecting. Uh, but you know, another conversation is uh, that has also been going around that, that don't you think that with these sanctions on Russia, that people will be running away from the dollar, so the dollar may not be the dominating currency anymore. But IMF has said, oh, that it's kind of happened because the truth is. There are lessons to be learned from all of this. And Absolutely. one of the lessons may be that countries would seek to be independent, more independent. Because if Russia did not have its reserve in dollars, dollars then these sanctions wouldn't have the kind of impact. not have an effect on it. And then you would not just remove them from SWIFT, and then they are failing, and then they are, you know, their currency would not be plunging and all that. So perhaps that is one conversation that is going on behind the scene you know, as a lesson uh, to be learned at this time. But a lot of people are going into gold now. The price has gone up, I think, about 30%. Absolutely. About that's, 30%. That's, that's what we have, yeah, 30%. Exactly. So it's a safe haven now for a lot of investors. Uh, but of course, I'm sure the Nigerian investors may also have their ears open uh, for that <laughs> to benefit from the leverage of the changes. Yes, I had one of uh, the last person you spoke to talking about how gas. Nigeria can take you know, advantage of gas. Absolutely, it's, it's really it's it's kind of you know annoying, can get you emotional when you think of you know some of the things we could do at this time. <laughs> you know, with the opportunities. I mean, not a good time, but I mean, we could have made a better use of this oh, time. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, food prices are also uh, going up. Again, something we talked about in the very first week. Yes. Uh, and then when we talked about wheat and so on. So again, and corn not a and all that. And you know, over the weekend, we still have the reports, you know, about the wheat and how it's affecting Nigerians. So yeah. don't be surprised. I mean, before now, we're having issues with corn because of the feed meal makers. Right. They couldn't uh, um, make feed meal or they were, they couldn't access enough corn. So they used to rely on wheat. Unfortunately, now wheat is no longer. The manufacturer we spoke to said that about a week ago, he had his, his warehouse filled with bags of wheat because it came as an alternative. It was not the first choice. Right. But at this time, they don't even have that. And the corn, they're also having issues with that because we import a lot of it. So uh, we can only imagine what will happen. But beyond that, uh, what the war has also done is to cause more disruption in the supply chain. Right. You know, so I know you know about the Black Sea port, um, moving right. things around, moving oil, uh, and it's really increasing transportation costs. It's really disrupting supply. So eventually, it ends up with food security. It's the global food security is really threatened at this time. Uh, Investors, of course, are also spooked, particularly Russian investors are spooked. Because all through this, something that may not have been spoken about much, but which is going on, is that the Moscow Stock Exchange has been closed. Yes. Has been closed all yes, through this Yes, since the 25th, period. it's been closed. They said today they were going to start trading on commodities and currencies, but I mean, I, I, let's see how it goes, because it's just today that they say they will start that. Because when you talk about currencies, I mean, we saw the queues at their ATM where people are going to withdraw dollars. That's right. You know, and that is for And there the, was a limitation placed on, exactly, the, on the amount you could withdraw. Exactly. So for them to say they want to start trading on currencies again today and commodities, let's just follow that space and see what the reaction or how it will look like. Indeed, uh, any, uh, your prescience as always, uh, <laughs> some of, many of the things we're talking about now are things that we raised in the very yes. first week and even last week mm -hmm. about this uh, war. So many of our listeners are not particularly... Uh, surprised. Mm. Many of our watchers are not particularly surprised. Thank you. Of course, Ini will be uh, uh, on uh, Business uh, Incorporated later on in the day. Yes. And Laddie Williams will be right here That's after this show. Yeah. And one of, one of the conversations to expect from those programs will be the issue of global oil prices. It's tapered a bit, but when you look at it in Nigeria, diesel is now more than 700 naira. Absolutely. Someone had predicted that to me on yes. Thursday. Yes. That it it's would reach more that, than so. 700 naira. Which has impact on the aviation industry. Of and course. of course, the manufacturing and industry. And remember the aviation industry guys said that uh, they may not last more than 78 hours. They may That's have right. to shut down. That's right. You know, and so we're, we're going to be keeping a close eye on that. Yeah, uh, so we'll have that conversation on, on our programs, our business So programs. our viewers our viewers will, of course, watch out for that. Thank you so very much. Thank you uh, for Ina. having Thank me. You. Thank you. Now, while, while many Ukrainians uh, flee their homes to seek safety, museum staff and volunteers, are protecting relics and artifacts by moving them into underground shelters. The National Museum in Lviv used to house thousands of masterpieces and artifacts. Now, in order to protect them from damage, the South have moved them to dozens of underground shelters around the city. Built in 1905, the Lviv National Museum is one of Ukraine's largest museums dedicated to the country's 
culture. It also boasts the biggest collection of Middle Age Ukrainian sacred art. None of these artworks have ever been moved to sacred shelters uh, before. And in sports, uh, it was a huge relief for Chelsea after the battle to a 1-0 win over Newcastle amidst uncertainty surrounding the club. Coach Thomas Chukul's frenzied goal celebration sprints down the touchline after Kai Havertz's 89th minute winner perfectly demonstrated the pressure Chelsea have been under this week. His team and the London club have been living with uncertainty about their future since the United Kingdom government imposed sanctions on Russian owner Roman Abramovich last Thursday and froze his assets. Chelsea, who are European champions and lying third in the Premier League, have been given a special license to continue to operate, but with severe restrictions. This we cannot influence, and that is at some point not so nice because you have no, no, no strings to pull and no actions to do to help. But on the other side, it gives you the freedom to, 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 to focus on the stuff we can influence. And this is our performances and show the spirit. Chelsea is much more than only the first team in Premier League. It's a massive club, a massive club with huge tradition. And there are so hundreds, hundreds of people who may be, I'm pretty sure, very more than uh, our players and, and, and the staff, me included. And, and for them, it's important that we show the spirit and, and we give them a bit of uh, distraction and, and kind of hope and, and, um, and, and, and show what we are about. We are about, about football because we love the game. And unfortunately, the situation, uh, the situation is like this also on, on for, for the owners of, of, of Newcastle and, and that affects in the end, yeah. It is, uh, what can I say? But I don't want to point the finger because like uh, comparing yourself or blaming the others does not make the situation for, for us a, a different situation. And I think like the statement that, that we condemn war and, and the action in, in from, from Russia towards Ukraine, there are like, uh, there's no doubt, but we are facing the consequences actually at the moment. And uh, this is where, where the focus is. I hope you can understand that. Meanwhile, fans of the club are divided on the impact of sanctions imposed on the owner uh, by the UK government for his alleged close links to Vladimir Putin as the Russian president wages war on Ukraine. Fans seem to agree on the need for sanctions, but some argue that Chelsea was being used as a scapegoat and that other Premier League clubs were equally not funded by, quote, clean money. hypocrisy that is involved in this whole situation is flabbergasting. Obviously the atrocious actions that Putin has taken in Ukraine can never be condoned, but also when you look at the other owners of football clubs, such as the Saudi Arabian ownership of Newcastle, where the UK government have licensed £7 billion worth of uh, weapons and arms to Saudi Arabia for the bombing of thousands of civilians in Yemen. Why isn't that looked at and sanctioned? I think what they've done against Roman Abramovich, as much as I like what he's done here, and we will never forget that. No, he had to be sanctioned. But I think at the present moment, it's the supporters who are really suffering. You know, why should we risk losing our club? We have no fault of our own. The fans are being sanctioned. Abranovich has never taken a pound out of this club. All he's done is put money into the club. He's never taken a pound out. It's the fans that are being sanctioned. I think um, Abramovich has suffered the consequences he had to, but don't bring our club into this. Don't, don't bring the millions of fans, the thousands of employees that are with the club, and don't drag them into this and use Chelsea as a scapegoat. The team that we're playing today, Newcastle, owned by Saudi, there's, there's enough uh, politics there as well, but you'll never hear them talk about that. And finally, and this time on a positive note in all the gloom, the Beijing 2022 Winter Paralympics ended with a closing ceremony at the National Stadium in the Chinese capital that carried the message of love after games that began with political chaos. Russian and Belarusian athletes were barred from competing by the International Paralympics Committee on the eve of the games following threats of boycotts by other teams over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Once the game started, though, Ukraine shone, ending their campaign second on the medals table with a total of 29 medals, 11 of which were gold. 
In his closing remarks, the IPC president, Andrew Parsons, hoped that the Paralympian movement would inspire world leaders to unite. And it's on that hopeful note that we end Russian invasion uh, this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. There'll be another update at 5 o'clock later on in the day. Do join us for that. I'm Ladi Akiri Dudwali. Have a pleasant day.